Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to For Fox Sake, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. I'm Ellen Ellen Bobellin, and my co-host is Katie Katie Bobady. Banana Fana Fofady. Me, my mo matey. Katie. Katie. Exactly. That's a thing that just happened. <laughs> and that being said, let's fly into the Phoenix flashback. Last week, we covered the first half of Chapter 22, St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries, and the somewhat corresponding film scenes. Harry seems to have all of the answers, but none of the questions. McGonagall gets to use her passion for creative writing to throw Pepto Bitch Mall off the scent. We learn that you're never alone in the wizarding world if you have a big enough art collection because they're magically connected. Dumbledore puts his travel agent license to good use by whipping up some black market port keys. Creature acts like a lawyer who knows he's going to be objected to but still says whatever the hell he wants anyway. Sirius does his best not to look outwardly excited that something is actually going on. And the Weasley kids handle the news of their father's attack with all the fire their tresses imply. Accurate. Mm -hmm. During episode 156, look at me, bitch! Our Potter pondering was, what do you think that silver instrument with the pale green smoke that Dumbledore used was and was telling him? Hi, Ellen and Katie. This is Ashley with this week's Potter pondering. What do I think the instrument with the pale green smoke is in Dumbledore's office? And I don't fucking know. I don't have a clue. But I know what it signifies, what it's supposed to mean, what it's supposed to be telling us. This is when Dumbledore figures out that Nagini is a horcrux because Harry is seeing through Nagini's eyes in his vision, my bobs, and a piece of Voldy is in the guinea, and that's why this happens. And that's why Demodore was all mystical, like, essence divided. Hmm. You know, as shit. So that's what that's supposed to mean. But as far as silver instrument with green smoke, and we don't know what the fuck this is from Harry's perspective, it's just to show us from Harry's perspective that Dumbly is the baddest bitch. You know, only bro who can fuck up Grindelwald, who can be a match for Voldemort, even though he can't kill him because the prophecy is just, oh, look at this bro in his office with all this fancy shit. I don't even know what the fuck it is. Damn, he tight. You know, I think that's all that was for. But I did turn over in my head a few times to, you know, kind of maybe make a guess. And it was kind of making my head hurt. Because I have no fucking clue, and I think that was the point. But yeah. Hey guys, Jackson here with my pot of pondering for this week. That little silver instrument of Dumbledore's. I think it was just to gain insight into the connection between Harry and Voldemort. And because it came up with an image of a snake, I think it confirmed Nagini being a Horcrux for him. So yeah, it was just more research into the Horcruxes. I don't know exactly what it does, how it shows it, but I think that's the best explanation. (laughs) Now, as for McGonagall's story to Umbridge, I think she would have just told them, the headmaster wants them, it's private, go back to bed, bitch. (laughs) Hi, Ellen and Katie, it's Megan calling in with my Potter pondering. I think that Dumbledore said, but in essence, divided. I think that he was talking about Voldemort's soul because he, at this point, had already suspected that Voldemort had been creating at least one Horcrux. So I think that this, for him, is the moment when he realized that the snake was one of Voldemort's Horcruxes. Thanks. Thank you so much for your responses. Love it. Our trivia question last week was, what is on the second floor of St. Mungo's? The second floor is where magical bugs or contagious maladies such as dragonpox, vanishing sickness, or scrofungulus are treated. 
And I'm sure there are more, but how do you follow Scrofungulus? Right? Just how do you do it? Congratulations goes to Megan Slater. Woohoo! She is at nine weeks in a row. Oh, shit. Mike has got to be getting nervous now. Mm hmm. If he's not, he better be. Right? Mm hmm. She's only a few weeks away from tying him. Can she do it? We shall see. For now, let's dive into the second half of Chapter 22, St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries, and the absolutely no corresponding film scenes. Chapter 22, St. Mungo's Hospital for Magical Maladies and Injuries, Part 2. At ten past five in the morning, a very pale and tired Mrs. Weasley enters the kitchen at Grim Old Place. But she gives a small smile and announces that he's going to be all right. He's currently sleeping, but they can all go see him later. George and Ginny go hug their mother, and Sirius joyfully announces breakfast and calls for Creature, who does not answer. Sirius mutters to forget it and settles on bacon and eggs, tea and toast. Harry hurries to the stove to help since he doesn't want to intrude on the Weasley's happiness and also dreads the moment where Mrs. Weasley asks him to recount what he saw. Instead, Mrs. Weasley pulls him into a hug and tells him that it is thanks to him that Arthur is alive. It also gave Dumbledore time to think of a good cover story for him being where he was so he doesn't get in trouble like Sturgis. Harry can barely stand her gratitude, but she releases him and also thanks Sirius for looking after her children. He says he's pleased he could help and invites them to stay as long as Mr. Weasley is in the hospital. She mentions that means they might be there for Christmas, and when Sirius sincerely says the more the merrier, Mrs. Weasley beams and starts helping with breakfast. Harry takes this opportunity to ask Sirius for a private word, and they walk into the dark pantry, where he tells his godfather all the details of the vision, including the fact that he had been the snake. Sirius wonders if Harry told Dumbledore this, and Harry impatiently replies that he did, but Dumbledore didn't tell him what that means. Sirius tries to reassure Harry that he's sure he would have if it was anything to worry about, but Harry also explains how he felt just before they took the port key. Sirius thinks it might have been the aftermath of the vision, and when Harry tries to argue that it was different, he firmly insists that he needs to sleep because he's in shock. Everyone but Harry spends the rest of the morning sleeping because he's afraid of who he might attack if he falls asleep again. When Ron wakes up, Harry pretends that he also enjoyed a refreshing nap. Their trunks arrive while they're eating lunch and they all dress in muggle clothes for their trip to St. Mungo's. Tonks and Mad-Eye Moody show up to escort them across London, Moody wearing a bowler hat at an angle to hide his magical eye. As they ride the underground to the hospital, Tonks is really interested in Harry's vision, wondering if he has any seer blood in his family. Harry thinks of Trelawney and feels insulted as he tells her no. Tonks continues musing that it wasn't really a prophecy since he saw the present, not the future, and Harry doesn't answer. They get out at the next stop and follow Tonks up the escalator, with Moody clunking along at the back of the group. Harry thinks he can feel Mad-Eye's concealed eyes staring at him, and to deflect more questions about his dream, asks where St. Mungo's is hidden. Moody explains that it isn't far, though it was difficult to find a good location for a hospital, since Diagon Alley isn't big enough and they can't have it underground like the Ministry since it isn't healthy. They ended up getting a building here and figured that sick wizards can come and go, blending in with the Muggles. They stop in front of a store called Purge and Douse Limited with large signs that read Closed for Refurbishment. Harry hears a woman walking by mention how the place is never open, but Tonks just approaches the window which houses a particularly ugly female dummy, which she greets and informs that they are there to see Arthur Weasley. The dummy nods and beckons its finger and they all step directly through the glass and vanish. On the other side of the glass, there's no sign of the dummy, just a crowded reception area. Some people look perfectly normal, flipping through out-of-date copies of Witch Weekly. Others are sporting gruesome disfigurements like elephant trunks or extra hands sticking out of their chests. One sweaty-faced witch repeatedly lets out a high-pitched whistle as steam pours out of her mouth, and another warlock clangs like a bell every time he moves. 
Harry sees the witches and wizards in lime green robes walking up and down the aisles, asking questions and making notes on their clipboards, and asks Ron if they're doctors. Ron explains that they are healers, and then Mrs. Weasley calls them all over to a queue in front of a desk marked in queries. On the wall behind it are posters about poisons and antidotes and a large portrait of a witch labeled Dillis Derwent. She's eyeing the Weasley party and gives Harry a tiny wink before she walks out of the portrait and vanishes. At the front of the line is a wizard performing an odd in-place jig as he explains that his brother gave him shoes that are eating his feet. The blonde witch behind the counter irritably asks him if the shoes prevent him from reading and points to the large sign to the left of her desk and tells him that he wants spell damage fourth floor, then calls for next. As they all move forward, Harry reads the sign, Artifact Accidents, Ground Floor, Creature Induced Injuries, First Floor, Magical Bugs, Second Floor, Potion and Plant Poisoning, Third Floor, Spell Damage, Fourth Floor, and Visitor's Tea Room and Hospital Shop, Fifth Floor. An old man with a hearing trumpet is at the front of the line now and wheezes that he's there to see Broderick Bode. The welcome witch tells him that he's in Ward 49, but also informs him that it's a waste of time since he still thinks he's a teapot. The next person in line is a wizard holding his young daughter by the ankle because she has sprouted wings. He's sent to the fourth floor, and then it is Mrs. Weasley's turn. She lets the witch know that they are there to see her husband, Arthur Weasley, but needs to know the new ward he was moved to. The witch checks her list and tells Mrs. Weasley that he is on the first floor, second door on the right, in the Di Llewellyn ward. Molly thanks her and ushers the kids through double doors, through a narrow corridor with more portraits, and up some stairs to a corridor marked Dangerous Di Llewellyn Ward, Serious Bites. Underneath that sign is a handwritten card that lists Hippocrates Smethwick as healer in charge and Augustus Pye as the trainee healer. Tonks tells Molly that they will wait outside so it can be just family first, and Harry tries to hang back too, but Mrs. Weasley pushes him through the door, insisting that Arthur wants to thank him. The ward is dingy with only three patients. Mr. Weasley occupies the bed at the far end by a tiny window and smiles when he sees his family. He tosses his copy of the Daily Prophet aside and tells his wife that Bill just left, but says he'll drop in on her later. She bends down to kiss his cheek and asks him how he is, telling him he still looks a bit peaky. Mr. Weasley says that he's absolutely fine, he just can't take the bandages off, since he starts bleeding like mad whenever they try, because there appears to have been some kind of poison in that snake's fangs that stops wounds from healing. He's sure they'll be able to find the antidote and just has to take a blood replenishing potion every hour in the meantime. He also lowers his voice to tell them that the man in the bed opposite was bitten by a werewolf and there's no cure at all, though they have been talking to him and trying to convince him that he can lead a mostly normal life. Fred then asks his dad if he's going to tell them what happened, and Arthur smiles at Harry and tells them that they already know, but he does explain that he had a long day, dozed off, got sneaked up on, and bitten. When Fred asks if the prophet reported the attack, Mr. Weasley almost slips and reveals too much information, but catches himself with his wife's warning and covers to avoid telling the children where he had been when it happened. Though Fred and George try to get more information out of him, Mrs. Weasley insists they aren't discussing it there and has Arthur talk about work-related things instead. The twins won't be deterred, and Mrs. Weasley finally just tells the kids to wait outside so Mad-Eye and Tonks can come in. Once back in the corridor, Fred fumbles in his pockets, annoyed that they won't tell them anything. George holds up a tangle of flesh-colored string and asks if he's looking for these, and the twins grin, untangling the extendable ears and passing them around. Harry is reluctant to take them, but they insist that he should, since he saved his life that totally gives him the right to eavesdrop on him. The flesh-colored strings wriggle under the door, and after a few seconds, they pick up Tonks' voice, talking about how they searched the whole area but couldn't find the snake anywhere. She also questions if you-know-who really expected a snake to be able to get it. Moody figures that the snake was sent as a lookout, and Arthur's presence likely interrupted that. 
He asks about Potter seeing it all happen, and Mrs. Weasley confirms this, also saying that Dumbledore seems to have been waiting for something like this to happen. Moody declares that there's something funny about that Potter kid, and Mrs. Weasley mentions how worried Dumbledore seems. Moody thinks he should be worried because it could mean that you-know-who is possessing Potter. At these words, Harry's heart begins hammering and he pulls out the extendable ears. He looks around at the others who are all staring at him fearfully. As literally none of this made it into the movie in any way, shape, or form, you are pretty much just going to hear us complain about the things that we got completely bilked on. Completely. Facts. Yeah, they just skipped over his entire hospitalization in the movie. Oh, yeah. No St. Mungo's at all. Nothing. Nothing. And I am so bummed about that. Yeah. Because there are some delightful things that could have just been so magical and fun to see. Not to mention, it was just such a great view further into the Wizarding World. Yeah. My God. I ew, am... David. Ew, fucking David. Or fucking ew, David. Something. I don't care. But you know what? Fuck that. <laughs> Yates. <laughs> Like, we didn't even get to see the mannequin or did, like, nothing. None of it. Nothing. Fuck. No, this half of the chapter starts off, it's just past five in the morning. Mm -hmm. They're all still mostly awake in the kitchen waiting to hear news about their dad. Understandably. And Mrs. Weasley shows up, gives him a small smile. She looks exhausted. She looks stressed as fuck. Mm -hmm. Mom look. Yeah. <laughs> but she is able to say that he is going to be all right. That's just got to be such a weight oh, off of everybody. Oh my gosh. Oh. Seriously. Mm -hmm. She explains that he's sleeping right now, but they'll go see him later. Yeah. George and Ginny go to hug their mom because they're so happy. Oh, dude, that'd be my first thing. Fred's reaction is to just kind of fall back in his seat, super relieved. Mm -hmm. Ron's so excited, he just chugs the rest of his butter beer. Sure. And Sirius actually jumps up and is just like, breakfast! <laughs> breakfast for all! <laughs> and he calls for Creature, but hears absolutely nothing in response. The elf does not appear like he is supposed to. Yeah, which, that's pretty sus. It's totally sus. Mm -hmm. And it's important, and nothing like this happens in the movie either. No, but no, madam. We find out more about this later. I just wanted to point it out now because yeah. it's a thing. Yeah, you gotta plant that seed, man. Oh, and the book did. Yeah. The movie did not. No, no. However, that's what happens when you cut out completely giant swaths of information and scenes and everything. Basically, a chapter and a half right here. Yeah. Easily. Yeah. 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 Huh. Hmm. <laughs> Anywho. <laughs> Sirius is just like, whatever, fine. And he just starts going to make breakfast himself. Mm -hmm. decides that bacon and eggs is going to be easy. He can handle that. Sure. Toast and tea. Mm -hmm. Standard bachelor food, I'd say. <laughs> I would, yeah. Easy to make for a slightly larger group. Mm -hmm. And Harry goes to help because he doesn't want to intrude on the Weasley's happiness. This is a family moment. Yeah. He has not fully accepted that he is part of this family yet. Mm -mm. Of course, he also feels super guilty and he does not want to have to tell the story again when he expects Mrs. Weasley will inevitably ask him about it. Mm -hmm. But what happens instead is she just pulls him into a Mama Weasley hug. Like she does. And tells him, thank you. Yeah. Because if it hadn't been for Harry, Arthur would have died. Yeah. And as we know from interviews, he was supposed to die. Mm -hmm. And basically she couldn't do it. Yeah. Which... I mean, we also know what she did do instead. Right. I don't know if I like the trade-off. I mean, I didn't like the way it did go, and I wouldn't have liked it the other way either. So I, I just... I'm gonna cry. Can we move on? Yeah, okay. Okay. She also tells Harry that because they got this forewarning of the attack, it gave Dumbledore time to come up with a story to explain why he was there even, which I'd love to know what that story is too. Mm-hmm. Definitely. And if he hadn't have been able to do that, he could have been in huge trouble, like with what happened with Sturgis Podmore, because he got arrested for being in the ministry when he wasn't supposed to be. Yeah. But he got caught 
red-handed. Right. There was no time to make up a story. Exactly. And that's why Dumbledore said he needed to be found by the right people. Right. Mrs. Weasley's gratitude, though, just kind of pokes at Harry's guilt. Well, yeah. He doesn't feel like he deserves this gratitude. At this point, he's still worried that he's the one who attacked him to begin with. Mm -hmm. So he's just like, yeah, I mean, I saved him, but I also hurt him. So (laughs) stop thanking me. I'm fucked up. (laughs) That should just be the title of the book. (laughs) (laughs) Episode title. (laughs) But anyway, Harry's very relieved that she releases him. Soon after. Yeah. And turns her gratitude towards Sirius, who just watched her kids throughout the night during probably one of the most stressful nights they've ever had. I was going to say, that's actually a really big thing. Right. And I love this little moment between them because we know they butt heads so much. And this is just the sweetest little sincere moment of appreciation between them. Yeah. Where Sirius is just like, I'm just so glad I could help because, A, he likes this family even if he doesn't always get along with Mrs. Weasley. Right. B, it gave him something to fucking do for the order. Yeah. And C, he's now not lonely. Exactly. And he was going in for a Christmas by himself with nobody but Creature and Buckbeak. Yeah. Which I'm sure he appreciates Buckbeak's presence, but that is not the same. I mean, everybody loves a good horsey bird. However, I don't necessarily know that that cancels out the loneliness for other humans. I'm going to say it doesn't. No. (laughs) Especially when you add in the fact that his other company was Creature. Yes. That's quite a downside. And it's a constant reminder that the majority of your loved ones are gone. Yeah. Like dead. Yeah. And the rest of the wizarding world thinks you're some sort of murderer. Yeah. So lonely. Super lonely. Yeah. Coming off of the trauma of 12 years in Azkaban. (laughs) Exactly. I mean, it's better than the Christmas he had the year before. Probably, yeah. I suppose, because that was like caves and rats and stuff like that. But it's really not much better. No. It might even be worse because at least he had a little bit more freedom then. He had freedom. A little bit. You know what? And he also felt like he had a purpose. Yes. At that time. Because he was like hunting down Peter Pettigrew and trying to keep Harry safe. Yes. And and all this kind of stuff. And now there's just nothing. There's nothing. And he's trapped in the childhood house that he fucking hated. Yeah. I think things went downhill for him. Yeah. You know what? I'm going to cry again. (laughs) So anyway, back to the sweet moment. Mm -hmm. He's happy he can help. And he also offers up them staying with him as long as Mr. Weasley's in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Because he is closer, like Dumbledore said. Yeah, it just makes sense. Yeah. And Mrs. Weasley is very grateful for this because she knows it puts them closer. Mm -hmm. And it'll be so much easier to go see him and whatnot. But she also says that it might mean we're here for Christmas. Yeah. And Sirius gives such a sincere... The more the merrier that Mrs. Weasley actually smiles. And I just think that's so sweet because of all of the times they butt heads and because she's had this really, really, really stressful night Mm -hmm. and Sirius was able to say something to cause her to smile. Yeah. He was able to like get through the doom and gloom of the evening. And he had to be just so relieved to hear that too. Yeah. And now... He's not going to be alone for Christmas. Hmm. And I love it. It's I do. so sweet. I do too. Definitely. Also, the fact that that's yet another thing less that Molly has to worry about is someone to keep an eye on the kids. Right. If they were at the borough, not only would she have to do all that traveling to St. Mungo's all the time. With all the kids. With all the kids or leave them at home. And who knows what would happen then. Oh, I think we all know what would happen then. (laughs) I mean, but that's on the good, like, who knows what bad things could happen, too. too. That's another issue. And at least now she's like, there's just got to be so much going on in her head. And, you know, one of her top priorities is going to be her kids. But obviously her husband is in grave peril, you know. Right. And to have Sirius just be like, you know what? I got this. I got you. Like... On a personal note, as a mom, there is no better feeling than knowing that your child is with someone you can trust. And she feels like she can trust him. At this moment, yes. And th- yeah. 
Especially because he made it through the night without like killing any of them, killing any of them, or doing the dangerous, serious thing, yeah. and being like, "Well, yeah, let's all go to the same mongos. I'll yeah. go with you. I'll be a dog." It's rah, 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 you know? rah, rah, rah. No, exactly. It's perfect. So, yay for this moment, and fuck you, David Yates, for not giving us this it. right. Mm-hmm. I think also to go along with what you were saying is it takes the pressure of having to plan a Christmas meal off of her plate as well yeah like she can and she probably will do still most of the work i'm sure she's absolutely gonna take charge because she can't not exactly it's molly weasley plus that would be a great distraction for her Mm -hmm. but the fact that she doesn't have to exactly that's a big deal and she'll have more help here Mm -hmm. but this makes her so happy she immediately starts helping with breakfast even though she's got to be exhausted oh yeah She gets that, like, surge of energy. Right. Like, okay, (laughs) let's do this. Breakfast for all. All the dopamine. (laughs) And this frees Sirius up enough that Harry can pull him aside to talk to him and confide in him, hoping that maybe he'll actually get some sort of insight on what the fuck's happening to him because Dumbledore wouldn't say anything. Right? No one else seems to know shit. So he pulls Sirius into the pantry for some privacy and tells him, this is what really happened in the dream. I was the fucking snake. And then I wanted to attack Dumbledore. Mm -hmm. And since this is the first time that Sirius is hearing about it, even though he got a little bit of the story, this is the first time that he's getting the actual, like, I was the snake. Mm -hmm, The full. Right. Yeah. And he wants to know if Dumbledore knows. And Harry's just like, of course, they fucking told him, but he didn't give me any answers. And Sirius is there like, this is probably not a good thing. But at the same time, I can't tell Harry that without talking to Dumbledore first. So he just tries to gloss over it and be like, I'm sure that if it was something to be worried about, Dumbledore would have said something. Certainly it's all fine and dandy. Mm -hmm. And he also tries to tell him that that feeling of wanting to attack Dumbledore might have just been aftermath of the vision. And Harry's just like, no, it fucking wasn't. (laughs) It was different. I was totally calm and then it rose up back inside me and I... I felt like the snake and I wanted to attack him and I think I'm losing my mind. And he's just like, no, you're just in shock. You just Mm -hmm. probably eat something, take a nap. You'll feel better. We'll get you a Xanax. Right. It'll be okay. So after breakfast, they all go to actually get some sleep since they pretty much stayed up the whole night. Mm -hmm. And of course, Harry is the only one who doesn't sleep because he's completely convinced that if he falls asleep again, he's going to turn back into a snake and attack somebody. Yeah, I would be want to stay awake as well. Heaven forbid that Dumbledore at least gave him a little bit of reassurance about that. Like, come on, man. I wonder if even like a draft of Dream of Sleep would help in that case. I don't know that Harry would want to take it. Like, he needed to be reassured by Dumbledore. True. He needed to know what was going on and to understand that he was not the one who actually attacked it. He just saw it that way. Because of the connection, not like he needed to know that way sooner. Yeah. Yeah. Would it have killed Dumbledore? No. Possibly. Well. (laughs) Anyway. Moving on. Eventually, everybody wakes back up. And when Ron wakes up because they share a room, Harry's just like, oh, yeah, that was a really good nap, too. (laughs) (laughs) And then they get to eat some lunch. Their trunks show up from Hogwarts because, yay, magic. Mm-hmm. And they all put on muggle clothes so they can go to St. Mungo's inconspicuously. Sure. It's Tonks and Mad-Eye who show up to escort them because Mrs. Weasley cannot be expected to take all of her kids and protect Harry Potter when she's stressed out about her husband right. across London. So he gets his guard. Plus, you know, just safety and numbers in general. Exactly. You know? And they're in such a good mood because they're all so relieved and now they're napped and refreshed that they just laugh at Moody who shows up with a bowler hat like (laughs) crooked over his face to hide his magical eye. Like that's not conspicuous. Not at all. And then he, despite being the one with a magical eye that's wearing a crooked bowler hat, is just worried that Tonks' pink hair is going to be the thing that stands out. And they're like, Tonks is going to be fine on the underground. She's going to blend in way better than you do. I was going to say, in London, I mean, I'm pretty sure nobody's given either of them a second look, really. Right? It's just, keep London weird, (laughs) (laughs) y'all. But on the train, Tonks keeps asking Harry questions about his vision. 
and wants to know if he has any seer blood, which just immediately makes Harry think she's comparing him to Trelawney. And he's like, what? Fuck you. No, I don't. <laughs> that just kind of makes me sad a little bit. Right? Like, it's not like there aren't real seers. It's not even like she's not a real seer. It's just very few and far between on her yeah. end. Just, you know, it's occasional. But Tonks is kind of oblivious to how annoyed he is by this and just keeps talking to herself almost mm-hmm. mostly like it's too hairy but it's not and she's just sort of thinking out loud oh it wasn't really a prophecy though because you were seeing the present and not the future so i don't really know i guess it's not seer blood but it's pretty handy and harry's just like i have nothing to say to this i really just whatever and thankfully they get to their stop soon enough so it kind of cuts off that yeah. one-sided conversation where harry's just like please leave me alone I can imagine her just being like, well, I mean, maybe if it was like a one second delay, that's technically the future. Suppo- you know, yeah, I guess that's maybe. Techn- you know, it doesn't matter how far into the future it is, but it is in the future. And then if you take into account daylight savings time and then and Harry's just like, fuck off. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> I'm so tired. But they all get out and Tonks leads them up the escalator. With Mad-Eye at the back, Mm -hmm. and Harry can just feel him staring at him with his magical eye, and he's just like, oh my god, he's going to start asking me questions next. So he very quickly goes, so where'd they hide St. Mungo's? Mm -hmm. Which works, and Moody starts to explain that it's not far from where they are, but it was really difficult to find a good location for a hospital because it needs to be very large and Diagon Alley is not really big enough for that. And it's not like they can put it underground like the ministry is because that's not very healthy yeah. for a hospital. Yeah, you need open space yeah. and for sure. Real sunlight. And- yes. <laughs> Maybe not sewer adjacent. Right. Just a thought. But they ended up acquiring a building not far from where they are, and they figured that sick wizards can come and go and just blend in with the muggles. And I love the fact that he specifically says this, because as we go through the wizards and witches that end up in St. Mungo's, the idea of them coming close to blending in with humans just cracks me up so much. Yeah. (laughs) But anyway, we're getting to that. Mm Mm-hmm. They get to a store that is closed, claiming it's for refurbishment, Mm -hmm. that is called Purge and Douse Limited, which cracks me up also, (laughs) because A, it is a terrible name for a store of any kind. Yeah, nothing in there sounds appealing. But it also kind of accurately applies to a hospital. Right? In the grand scheme of things, it's pretty descriptive of a hospital, yes. Amusing little thing there. Yeah. But as they're walking up to the window, this muggle woman is walking by and you just hear her kind of say, well, this place is never open. Like, that's not suspicious, but just walk on past it. Don't think anything of it. Right. I got to wonder what her style is like if she kind of sounds like she wants it to be open. Right. (laughs) Or just curious. But Yeah, I guess. Anyway, Tonks leads them up to the window. And in this window, there's just... A very ugly female dummy, like a mannequin. Mm -hmm. And she says, watch her, and leans forward to whisper that they're there to see Arthur Weasley. And Harry has this moment where he's like, how is the dummy going to hear her speaking that? How is the dummy going to hear her? (laughs) It's a dummy. Harry, you forget so quickly. Completely forgetting magic Mm -hmm. because then all of a sudden the dummy looks at her, nods. And beckons them with her finger. Also, side note, that's creepy as fuck. Yes. No, I'm not fucking with dummies that come to life. Not doing it. Not after Doctor Who, no. No. (laughs) Even before Doctor Who, it's way too much like creepy ass dolls. I don't fuck with them. Fair. No. But Tonks grabs, I think, Ginny and Mrs. Weasley's arms. I know, like the first two. And she just sort of pulls them straight through the glass into Mm -hmm. the window. And Harry just kind of looks around like... Did anybody notice people just vanish into a window and nobody's paying any attention? So they all just follow through. This from the boy who's been running straight at a wall for right? five years at this point. Like, this is pretty par for the course, Harry. Yeah. <laughs> but they go through the glass and he's kind of surprised to see that there's no sign of this dummy. Once on the other side of the glass, they just find themselves in a reception area. Sure. And this is just my favorite part because... 
some people look normal and they probably can blend in just fine. Mm -hmm. But there's other people that have gruesome disfigurements, as it's described in the book, like elephant trunks or extra hands sticking out of their chests. Because, yes, no muggle's going to be suspicious of that. (laughs) That blends right in. No, not at all. I mean... I'm sure some parents would love an extra set of hands, but it's still going to look weird. Might be handy. Oh, for fuck's sake. (laughs) Fucking, I I walked into it. I can't even. (laughs) There's also a witch that's sweating and occasionally lets out a high-pitched whistle as steam pours out of her mouth. (gasps) She's a little teapot. She's a little teapot. (laughs) Totally subtle. And she's probably going, look at me, bitch. Probably. (laughs) Or in that case, she might be like, don't look at me, bitch. (laughs) But there's a warlock that clings like a bell when he moves. Like, these are not subtle. This is not blending in with muggles. No, not so much. It's very entertaining. Yeah. And I like, could you imagine getting to see this come to life in the movie? I can imagine it. But it just makes me sad because it didn't actually happen. I know. If they ever do remake these, we better get more of this magical background fun. Because it just expands the world. Yeah. It expands the magical world. The number of times in the book that something happens and it completely changes everything about the wizarding world for you. Like finding out that the paintings can go from one painting to another. Like finding out that a mannequin is not just a mannequin. Right. All of these things... They're just not in the movie. They're not. And they do include some things. But I think that's one of the reasons why I like Prisoner of Azkaban the best. Because they included the most just magical touches outside of the plot. Yeah. Just random stuff. Yeah. Even just in the background. That's fine. Like the wizard using his Mm -hmm. hand to magically stir the spoon. He wasn't touching it. He just moved his finger. Yeah. Or the bartender who like disappears the bottle by putting the rag over it and stuff. Like all of that stuff. Just everything that was just in the background. And you just kind of went, that's just so awesome to see. We could have had so much of that here. I can't even really think of anything in this movie that is specifically magical. I mean, you have the basic plot, but everything, it was like so streamlined to tell the story. Yeah. I kept being plot driven. I get it. And it should be. But at the same time, it could be a plot driven movie and still include those magical touches. The visuals. It's a fucking movie. Have magical visuals for us. Yeah. That's the whole idea, right? We didn't start reading these books because it's about a little shit named Harry who had a scar on his head. Like, and a pension for meddling. Yeah, we read these books and we fell in love with these books because of the magic. It, it was, was the, the magic. damn magic. Fucking magic. Bam, magic. Right? <laughs> Bam, <laughs> to do a, magic. To do a little recall of our very second episode. <laughs> our first official episode. Our first, yes. You just didn't get that with the movies. Not as much as I would have liked. There were definite moments. No. And everything that we did get, like, most of it was already established Mm -hmm. as being a thing. It was the portraits moving. It was being able to talk to the portraits. Mm -hmm. It was, and that was great, but it wasn't explained that portraits could go to other portraits of themselves. Right. Yes, Dumbledore sends Everard to go check on things and sends... Phineas to go to Grimmauld Place. But, like, you don't understand what that means. Or why they're able to do that. Yeah. You don't understand any of that stuff because we never saw Harry in Grimmauld Place hearing the voice coming from the painting of Phineas. It was never there. And this section actually gives us a little bit more about that, Mm -hmm. even. Because you got all of these witches and wizards that are fucked up. Mm -hmm. And there are witches and wizards wearing lime green robes, walking up and down the aisles and asking questions and taking notes. Mm -hmm. And I love this moment, too, because Harry asks Ron if they're doctors. And Ron's just like, what the fuck's a doctor? Oh, you mean those muggle nutters that cut people up? (laughs) Yeah, them. Yeah, them. (laughs) But he explains that the magical community uses healers. Mm -hmm. There's no cutting people up. That's not how they do it here. They use magic. I'm not going to lie. I kind of like the word healer better than doctor because... Doctor sounds more pretentious. Definitely. More clinical. Yeah. Doctor. 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 Handshake. Doctor. Anyway. (laughs) Like, whereas healer? 
Healer. Healer. That just sounds so much more calm and chill. Anyway, what I was talking about before we got off topic. Mrs. Weasley calls them all over to get in line in front of a desk for inquiries. And behind this desk are some posters about antidotes and poisons. Mm -hmm. It's like potions are poisons if you use the wrong ingredients and anti dotes are anti don'ts <laughs> without <laughs> a healer's approval it's so yeah. cute i love it it's kind of like the anti-drug campaigns yeah kind of where it's like marijuana is a gateway drug and crack is whack and <laughs> yeah. stuff like that <laughs> hugs not drugs antidotes are anti don'ts exactly except isn't an anti don't two negatives it's a double negative so it means do it Teenage me is going to say yes to that, obviously. Do the antidotes. Do them. Do them, kids. Anyway, don't do drugs. Or do drugs. Do all the drugs. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, the point that I've been trying to get to, but there's so many other little things along the way, yes. is next to these posters is a very large portrait of a witch that is labeled Dillis Derwent. We know that name. We know that name. Not from the movie. Not from the movie. No. But this, of course, is the witch that Dumbledore sent to St. Mungo's in her other portrait to watch as Arthur Weasley arrived to make mm -hmm. sure he made it there safely and everything. And yeah. Report back what they hear and whatnot. For sure. So she's just kind of watching the Weasley party. I'm assuming that she was sent there by Dumbledore to make sure they all got there okay and everything. Right, yeah. She catches Harry's eye and winks at him and then just walks out the side of the portrait, probably to go tell Dumbledore that they made it there just fine. Yep, for sure. And then just more adorable little not going to blend in with muggles sort of things is at the front of the line is this wizard who's like dancing in place. And trying to explain to the woman at the desk that his brother gave him shoes that are eating his feet. <laughs> And this witch wants nothing to do with this. She is so sick of people asking stupid questions. Do the shoes prevent you from being able to read? And she points to a sign <laughs> next to her desk that very clearly says spell damage is on the fourth floor. Yeah. You want the fourth floor? Get the fuck out of my sights. Right. I am not the person you talk to. You need to look at what the sign says and fuck off to there because I'm not here for this. So he dances away, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And the line moves forward. And Harry reads the sign to find out what's on all of the floors. Mm -hmm. And it's artifact accidents on the ground floor, which includes cauldron explosion, wand backfiring, broom crashes, etc. 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 Then the first floor has creature-induced injuries, mm -hmm. which includes bites, stings, burns, embedded spines, etc. Ew. The second floor is magical bugs, which includes contagious maladies like dragon pox, vanishing sickness, and scrofungulus. <laughs> which, that was our trivia question. It sure was. Again, I'm so curious about Scrofungulus, but all the, the same time, I want to know nothing about it. I'm not going to lie. I picked this one as the trivia question just so we could say Scrofungulus a bunch. You're welcome. Well, that's rude. <laughs> Super rude. So moving on. Ellen. The third floor is potion and plant poisoning. Mm -hmm. That includes rashes, regurgitation, uncontrollable giggling etc sure oh my god how hilarious would that be to like get a glimpse of the third floor where people are just laughing it depends on the laugh true entirely depends on the laugh if it's my child she's got an adorable laugh and i will <laughs> listen to that all day long however if it's someone who like cackles like <laughs> constantly i would cry how was that again <laughs> <laughs> hope you like that i did i wouldn't want to hear it all day nor am I asking you to do it all day, so... Thank God. Moving, Moving on. on. <laughs> Spell damage is on the fourth floor. This includes unliftable jigses, hexes, and incorrectly applied charms, etc. Mm-hmm. Which is where they sent off the dancing guy with feet-eating shoes. Sure. And then the fifth floor has the visitor's tea room and the hospital shop. Which is funny to me because I feel like... The hospital shop and stuff would normally be on the first floor. That's so that, supposed to be right when you walk in. Yeah, you go through it and you buy stuff on your way to where you're going, so yeah. they spend more money. But if you put it up on the fifth floor, then you have to go out of your way to get there, and I feel like they're going to lose money because of that. Definitely. 
The next person in line is an old man with a hearing trumpet. I love those things. And he just kind of wheezes out. He's like hunchbacked. Mm -hmm. I don't know how old he is. If he's hunchback and needs a hearing trumpet, he's got to be pretty old in the wizarding world. Eh, Theoretically. But he just wheezes that he's there to see Broderick Bode, which we have heard that name before. Yes. And we'll hear it again, at least in the book. What? And the welcome witch just says that he's in Ward 49, but going there is honestly a waste of time because he still thinks he's a teapot. And that's just a theme, right? (laughs) I wonder if he is just addled in his brains and thinks he's a teapot. Like, does he keep trying to pour himself? Or is he like the witch in the waiting room who is literally steaming and whistling? Or is he just hairy and he's just yelling shit? Randomly, be. you know. So after he goes off where he's supposed to go to visit Broderick Bode, the next person in line is this wizard who's like holding his daughter almost like a balloon is the way that I imagine it. He just has <laughs> her by the ankle up in the air and she's grown wings just straight out of her back. And he's just flying and he's just holding her by the ankle so she can't get away. Oh, good Lord. Totally blends in with the muggles. The idea of any child growing wings. Is just frightening to me. Don't give him Red Bull. No. Especially don't give him Red Bull. I would say for more reasons than just the wings, but (laughs) yes, that's (laughs) good rule of thumb. Yeah. This is another case for the fourth floor. Mm Mm-hmm. And then the Weasleys are up. And Mrs. Weasley tells the witch that they are there to visit her husband, Arthur Weasley, but he was supposed to be moved that morning and she wasn't sure where he was now. Mm -hmm. So she checks her list and says he's on the first floor, the second door on the right, in the Di Llewellyn ward. Mm -hmm. Molly says thank you, ushers her kids along, and they go through a corridor and up some stairs, and there's more portraits watching them. And they get to another corridor that's marked dangerous, that's in quotes, dangerous, Mm -hmm. Di Llewellyn ward, serious bites. How often is Sirius biting people that he has his own ward? Wrong Sirius. Oh. (laughs) I don't know. It wasn't in the movie. Right? (laughs) Confusing. Yeah. And then there's a little handwritten sign that lists Hippocrates Smethwick as the healer in charge. I love that name. Right? Mm -hmm. And Augustus Pye as the trainee healer. And we do hear a touch more about them in the next chapter, too. Mm -hmm. Their role in helping Mr. Weasley out. Not... In the movie. No. Fucking bullshit. So they're outside the ward and Tonks suggests that she and Mad-Eye wait outside so it can just be family and Mad-Eye seems to approve of this and they both stand back and Harry tries to hang back too. But Mrs. Weasley just shoves him through the door like, don't be silly, Arthur wants to thank you. Mm -hmm. And Harry's like, I don't deserve his thanks. (laughs) I'm the reason he's here, I think. Yeah. But they go through into the ward and it's kind of small and dingy. Mm -hmm. But there's only three patients. So that keeps it a little bit more open. Mr. Weasley is in the bed over there on the opposite end and he's got a little tiny window. He's obviously very happy to see his family. He's awake. He's alert. Of course. Tosses his copy of the Daily Prophet aside, informs them that Bill was just there but had to leave to get to work. But he said he'd drop in on her later and see how she's doing. And she bends down to kiss her husband on the cheek and says, how are you? You look peaky still. Because <laughs> she's Molly. Bit peaky. Bit peaky. I actually would have really loved to see this exchange between them two. Oh my god, I'm sorry. We didn't get enough of Mr. and Mrs. Weasley getting to be the adorable couple goals that they are. No. It's very upsetting. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Mrs. Weasley thinks that he looks peaky still. And Mr. Weasley insists that he's absolutely fine. If they could take the bandages off, he'd be good to go home. Yeah. So they're like, why can't they take the bandages off? He's like, oh, because I bleed like mad whenever they do. (laughs) No worries, though. Totally good. He actually says that, though. He's like, it's fine, though. There just seems to be some kind of poison in the snake's fang that stops this wound from healing. So, yeah, they're going to find the antidote at some point. And in the meantime, I just take a blood replenishing potion every hour because that's super convenient. Part of the reason why he's so high spirits and sure that he's going to be fine, it's not that big of a deal, is because one of the other patients in the room was bitten by a werewolf. And of course, Molly is immediately like, a werewolf, is it safe? And Arthur's just like, Molly, it's two weeks from the full moon. Mm -hmm. Like, we know a werewolf. We're around him all the time. Stop acting stupid. Yeah. And he says that 
there's no cure for that at all. But they've really been trying to talk to him about how he can lead a mostly normal life. And he was like, I even tried to tell him that I knew a werewolf who got to live fairly normally and he handles it just fine. Yeah. And I'll get you in touch. Yeah. yeah. And they're like, <laughs> and they're like, what did he say to that? And he says, oh, he threatened me with another bite if I don't stop talking. <laughs> Oh, so you mean they don't want to go to the dog park together? No. <laughs> Fred then tries to change the subject to get some information out of his dad. And he's just like, so you're going to tell us what happened? Nope. And Arthur just smiles at Harry and says, I mean, you already know what happened. Mm -hmm. I had a long day. I dozed off. A snake snuck up on me and he bit me. Yeah. Fred then asks if the prophet reported the attack because Mr. Weasley had just been reading it. And Mr. Mm -hmm. Weasley says, oh, no, they don't want to know that a bloody great snake nearly got in the me. <laughs> 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 I mean, it wasn't quite that awkward, but he was starting to say got in the ministry. Yeah. And Molly was just like, Arthur. <laughs> and he said, got me, nearly got me. The snake nearly got me. Ixnay on the industry, mate. Damn right? it. <laughs> So naturally, Fred and George immediately start trying to get more information out of him. And Mrs. Weasley's just like, uh-uh. Tell us about work, Arthur. What were you doing earlier in the day? Right. This isn't Hagrid, guys. Right. Not that far off at moments. True. But definitely better at secrets than Hagrid. Definitely. Immediately caught in himself, changed the subject, talking about work. And the twins are just like, uh-uh. We want to know more about this. And we want to know more about this. And we want to know more about this. And we want to know it now. And Mrs. Weasley finally was just like, out. <laughs> you wait in the corridor. We're going to bring Mad-Eye and Tonks in so they can talk to Arthur, too. Yeah. So they, you know, begrudgingly leave. Fred's just like, fine, don't tell us anything. And he's fumbling in his pockets. And George <laughs> holds up the extendable ears and just says, you looking for these? And he's just like, you read my mind because they're twins. Obviously, yeah. And they untangle them and start handing them out to everybody. And Harry's really reluctant to take his. He feels really weird about eavesdropping. And they say, dude, Harry, you saved dad's life. If anybody has the right to eavesdrop on him, it's you. And Harry's just like, mm, did I though? Or did I cause it to be in danger to begin with? But Harry meddling Marie Potter totally falls for this logic. Right. For real. And he takes the extendable ears and they all put one end in the ear and then it like wiggles like a flesh colored worm under the door. Ew. Which the description of them here makes them seem really different than how they portrayed them in the movie because it had the literal ear hanging on the end of it. Yeah. Whereas these were a little bit more subtle. Like people may not notice the little worm-like thing hanging mm -hmm. out under the door, but an actual ear yeah, would definitely be noticeable. Definitely. So. It was more like two cans connected with a string in the movie because they were holding an ear like to an their ear. ear. An ear. Yeah. And then there was an ear at the bottom. And like, I get that logic. And I guess that made it seem more understandable visually. Yeah, it was cute. But at the same time, it was not practical. It was not how I imagined it. Either. No. But anyway... Regardless of what they looked like, they worked to help them eavesdrop on conversations. Mm -hmm. And St. Mungo's do not put imperturbable charms on their door so they can hear everything just fine. And once reception gets figured out, it jumps into them listening to Tonks talking about how they searched the whole area but couldn't find the snake anywhere. It apparently just vanished. And then she also says, I don't get it, though. Do you think that you know who actually thought the snake would be able to get it? And yet another mention of the infamous it. Right. Mm -hmm. So we know there's something there. Yeah. We knew from before that there's something Voldemort was after. The movie did give us that he did not acquire it. Yeah. And then we heard Sirius like dream voice serious saying that right. he's looking for something he didn't have last time this confirms that it wasn't necessarily an attack on arthur it was an attack on whoever was there at the time or they weren't expecting somebody to be there and he just sent the snake as a lookout which is yeah. what moody thinks true he says you know who probably sent the snake to just look around and see what was there that would be an obstacle and, yeah some reconnaissance yeah and encountering will. arthur interrupted that yeah had arthur not been there he probably would have gotten a better look mm -hmm. but no arthur fucked that up good job arthur you really did your job just maybe a little too enthusiastically yeah anyway 
Moody is figuring that the snake was a lookout. He also asks about Potter seeing the whole thing because they heard that he saw it, but now he's just like, he saw all of it? Like, yeah. from the snake's point of view? And Molly says, yeah. Not just the aftermath of it? No, or, he yeah. saw it, mm-hmm. and Dumbledore seems really worried about it. But it's almost like he's been waiting for something like this to happen, so even though he's worried, he was not surprised. Yeah. And Moody thinks it's perfectly understandable that Dumbledore is worried. He thinks he should be worried because it is likely that that means you know who is possessing Potter. And Potter obviously has no idea that that's the case until now because extendable ears. Right. Great time to find out when you're like surrounded by your friends who are all hearing it at the same time as well. Yeah, and he should have been told that from Dumbledore. Yes, much definitely. sooner, immediately after this happening, mm-hmm. or at least by a proxy of Dumbledore. Something, like, something. To find this out in this way freaks the fuck out of him. He pulls the extendable ear out. His heart starts pounding and he just looks around at everybody who are now looking at him scared. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if they're scared of him or scared for him or maybe like a mixture of both. Yeah. But that look on their face has got to just send him further into the spiral that he's already in. Yeah. Almost reminiscent of Chamber of Secrets when everybody thought he was the heir of Slytherin. Right. And everyone was like looking at him in such a way. And even at the time, he didn't know. Mm -hmm. Am I doing this and not knowing it? We're having flashbacks to that moment. Harry certainly is. Mm -hmm. And he feels, I imagine anyway, he feels like if he is being possessed by Voldemort, that Voldemort is making him do these things. And he is doing them. Mm -hmm. So this does not make him feel any better to find out in this manner. No. And this is totally a fuck up on Dumbledore's part for not just telling him. Definitely. I mean, it was volatile information to find out to begin with, but then to find out from another source who wasn't even addressing him. Right. Because you were eavesdropping. You can't even go talk to somebody about it because you weren't supposed to hear it. Exactly. It's all of the awkward. It is. But Mm -hmm. it is also where the book chapter ends. I mean, good time for it to end. Yeah, it's a hell of an ending. It is. Yeah. It's like a cliffhanger cut off of that chapter. Thank goodness the next chapter has already been released. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Good thing there's no waiting to see what happens next. Right. Except for this podcast, because you'll have to wait till next week. Yep, that's how it is. Mm Mm-hmm. And since there were no movie scenes, as we have discussed at length, that means that there are no actors to talk about. No, but there should have been. They're really... God... So many. really should have been. Dillis would have been great to see. All the healers. All of the background witches and wizards with elephant trunks and extra hands and teapot whistling and steam and the little girl with the wings. And the mannequin. That would have scared the shit out of me, but I still would have liked to have seen it. Worth it. I digress. But yeah, so no actors. No actors. Let's just move on to the Potter pondering. I guess. What we really want to know is what you think about the movie leaving out the visit with Arthur and St. Mungo's and the kids overhearing Harry might be possessed by Voldemort. I don't know that any of you are happy about this, so we're just going to give you this opportunity to rant. Yeah. Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts or call us at 216-526-6792 and leave your response as a voicemail. Make sure you start off telling us your name and then go into your answer. If you get it to us by the Wednesday before, we'll be able to get that in the episode. Mm -hmm. If not, don't forget, you can also stitch your response on TikTok or just comment it on social media. We really look forward to reading, hearing, and seeing them. Mm -hmm. This will bring us to our Sorting Hat story, which is from Justin Reynolds. He writes, I had known of Harry Potter in high school, but didn't give it much thought until after a stint in the military. Loading up trucks the morning that Order of the Phoenix was released helped feed my curiosity. It didn't take long to catch up, even trying to stretch out the Order of the Phoenix, because waiting for the next book in the series was going to be a miserable slog. I was suspicious of the movies as well, waiting to watch them on DVD. I was just as impressed as I was with the books, often going back and forth mid-movie. My Patronus is a stoat. 
My wand is fir wood with a phoenix feather core, 12 and 3 quarters inches, and supple flexibility. The Sorting Hat always takes me between Slytherin and Gryffindor. Pottermore doesn't give me a definitive answer, and due to recent events, I can't in good faith go back to try and find something a bit more solid. Because Pottermore makes me choose, I'd have to pick Gryffindor. But it's close. I'd say by about 10 house points. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your Sorting Hat story with us, Justin. Happy to have you on Team Gryffindor. Yes, thank you. Aside from the Gryffindor part. <laughs> I'll let that slide because I love you. And if any of the other keepers out there listening would like us to read your Sorting Hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might want to share with us. Or you can message it to us over social media. This week's trivia question is, what message does Dumbledore send Phineas Nigellus Black to give Harry? The first person who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag that's it will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes or Facebook. Make sure to email us at forfoxsakepodcast at gmail.com to let us know you did and we will get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Pod. Following us on Podbean at foxsakepod.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. You can also go to our website at forfoxsakepodcast.com to check out our For Fox Sake and Harry Potter related merchandise for sale. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, vlogs, bloopers, and other random videos. If you would like to support us as a patron, you can sign up on patreon.com slash foxsakepod. $2 and up a month will get you some awesome perks like For Fox Sake swag, access to patron-only Facebook groups, chats, our Discord channel, virtual hangouts, and more. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated even if it's just telling your Harry Potter friends about us. And if you don't have any Harry Potter friends, there's another reason to join our Patreon, because you will meet some of the best Harry Potter people ever. I mean, just the best people ever, really. There's that too. Period. End of sentence. And join us next week when we talk about the first half of Chapter 23, Christmas on the Closed Ward, and the not-really-corresponding film scenes, though... At least there are some film scenes. Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. And in the meantime... Keep calm and Harry on! Oh, for fuck's sake. Oh.